Professor Keith Bowman. Um, just a few words about him. He is the chief of the Department of Mechanics, Materials, and Aerospace Engineering in, at the Illinois Institute of Technology in, in Chicago. Uh, he did his PhD in the University of Michigan, and he has spent uh, many years at Purdue University, where he has been also the chief of the Department of Materials there at, at Purdue. Um, he's not working on graphene, sorry, <laughs> but uh, he, he has he has uh, performed a very good, very good work on ceramics, and especially today he's going to talk about piezoelectric materials, about directional properties, textures, I think, on, on, on piezoelectric materials. And, and that's all for me, and thank you very much for coming, Keith, and now it's your turn. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, happy to have had the opportunity to be here this week, also spend some time teaching class, even in this room. With the students earlier, I asked them questions and they had to get in groups. I don't know if I will do that to you guys, but maybe we will see. But uh, we can forward. As far as uh, information about me, you know, I, I work on mostly in preferred orientation in ceramic materials. And for the first half of my career, it was in ceramic and ceramic composites and structural materials. And more recently, the last 10 years, it's been mostly on piezoelectric materials. Uh, there has been some work also on pharmaceutical materials used for uh, tablets. So actually go this way. So uh, tell you a little bit about Illinois of Institute of Technology. I always like to spend a few minutes because there's always some mystery as to how the institutions formed, where they come from. Uh, IIT, as it's known as IIT Chicago. There are many IITs in India for some reason as well. Uh, but IIT uh, was founded uh, in a church, actually, it was in a church sermon that a minister was giving a church sermon and said that if someone would give him a million dollars, this was in 1890, if someone would give him a million dollars, he would create an institution for everyone to go to school in, to, uh, to learn at an advanced level. And uh, this is a picture I took from an airplane of Chicago a couple years ago. This is the, the downtown of Chicago, and uh, I actually live just a little bit up here. And IIT's campus is located down here, right near where the Chicago White Sox play baseball. And uh, so it's about, uh, it's about four miles, six kilometers, from uh, downtown Chicago. It's also on three train lines, so it's, uh, it's pretty convenient and easy to get there. So IIT was founded as a place to be open to, uh, to anyone to attend. Uh, turns out uh, the first chemical engineer graduated from IIT was an African-American. We also will believe was the first African-American chemical en engineer in the United States. Challenge was, of course, him finding employment. He ended up actually teaching school because he was not hired by any, any companies at that time. But, uh, but he was among the first students who graduated from our program, and we have a number of scholarships that are named in honor of him. Uh, in our field, uh, in metallurgy, precursor to materials, uh, the first degree in, uh, in metallurgy uh, was a PhD. Um, in 1950, and it was given to Dr. Frank Crossley, who was the, uh, ended up working a lot in the aerospace industry and actually working on materials and materials development for missiles and rockets. And uh, so had a long career, was known as an expert on particular types mm -hmm. of titanium alloys. Uh, IIT is also home in terms, we have a professor uh, emeritus, so she's retired, uh, Lois Graham. Uh, she was at Rensselaer Polytechnic in the United States she was one of the first two bachelor's degrees in the United States uh, uh, in engineering to, at RPI. Um, she was uh, the first uh, woman to receive a master's degree in our program in, uh, in mechanical engineering. And she was the first American woman to uh, receive a PhD uh, in mechanical engineering in the United States. And that was in 1959. And so those are all things that are part of, uh, of the characteristics of IIT. To give you some perspective on Lois, uh, the Society of Women Engineers, which is SWE, uh, interviewed her about 10 years ago. And so in this, I just pulled a couple of the quotes, and uh, perhaps this is a way to show how things have changed. So the first quote is that she had an interview with General Electric, and they said, well, now we can't pay you what we would pay a man, but you can make it up by working overtime. And uh, so uh, that doesn't sound too fair. I don't think that that would be legal at this point. Um, in terms of applying to graduate school, she wrote to a, a number of schools, Caltech, California Institute of Technology, uh, 
uh, sent her a postcard that was essentially the equivalent of a pre-typed postcard, but they crossed out everything on the postcard and wrote in, we do not accept women. And uh, so IIT actually accepted her, gave her a, a stipend in order to support herself, and also uh, built a bathroom in the laboratory building so that there was a woman's room in that building. So, uh, so that's a little bit of the character of the institution. So this is our campus, uh, uh, taken from our, our tower building. We have a 19-story tower. The president's office and the provost's office are on the top of that tower. So if you go up to their office, you can take a picture of the campus. Um, our campus was uh, designed by Mies van der Rohe. Uh, he was the uh, director of our architecture program. He designed the layout of the campus. He also designed Crown Hall, which is here, which is considered to be one of the most significant uh, pieces of architecture in Chicago, as well as the United States. Our campus is actually part of the National Historic Register, so it's a registered historic place because of the design of the campus. Uh, he designed, uh, Van der Rohe designed the layout of the campus, but also uh, about half of the buildings on the campus. This is also our student center. Student center, on top of our student center is uh, uh, about a 500 foot concrete and steel tube that's there to mitigate noise and uh, noise production. Um, it's called the wormhole, but it's actually the train goes through above it, and this is actually a, a dormitory. And so our campus was designed really often by uh, architecture competitions as well. So, uh, and we have, particularly during the spring and summer, lots of tour buses that come by with people who come to take pictures of our building. They don't really come to take pictures of us, but, uh, but they take pictures of our building. So IIT has about uh, 2,600 undergraduates, about 5,000 graduate students, almost 400 full-time faculty, and about uh, a little bit over 300 part-time faculty. And the overall for the university student to faculty ratio is about 10 to 1. Um, this is actually the the student center designed by Rem Kuhlhaus. For mechanical materials and aerospace engineering, we have 24 faculty, 400 undergraduate students, and about a, 130 full-time graduate students and about 50 part-time graduate students. Uh, we also have about 6,000 uh, living alumni for the program. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about uh, piezoelectric materials. Uh, I'm going to talk about directional properties. Um, these are my students. Uh, he recently completed his master's degree. Matthias Emka is a student originally from Darmstadt, Germany, who uh, started with me a little bit over two and a half years ago. And Chris Fancher, who hopes to defend his thesis successfully two weeks from today. And so, uh, so is on a project supported by the National Science Foundation, uh, which is uh, a, a part of a, a category called Focused Research Group, that was, that's what FRG means. And it's on domains in lead-free piezoelectric materials. So piezoelectricity uh, was discovered in 1883 by Jacques and, and Pierre Curie. And uh, uh, I have the translation down below, since my French is not so good, but uh, it's a picture of Pierre that essentially is talking about how deviations from symmetry cause the phenomenon. Most of my interest is in symmetry, preferred orientation, anisotropy, directionality. And uh, so that's how I actually became interested in doing work on it. Um, I'll just focus on this. Uh, this is actually the translation of the quote, the, the electrical effect of compression is like that of cooling. Essentially, when you compress a uh, piezoelectric material, it's the, the same uh, characteristic and, uh, as cooling, and decompression is that of heating. This is tension um, regarding the directions and signs of the produced charge. That was in a comparison for materials that show pyroelectricity, uh, natural materials like tourmaline, zinc blend, boracite, topaz, and quartz naturally have both pyroelectricity, which means they get a charge based on temperature, and also uh, have uh, uh, mechanical effects on piezoelectricity. So this is my very quick tutorial as to my perspective of the important things to think about in how piezoelectrics work. There are numbers of classes and materials of piezoelectrics and similar materials that exist, and so they have features that are different than what I show here. The ones I'm going to show, though, and the materials I'll show today, we study the parts of their behavior that correspond to what I'm going to show, for the most part. So a crystalline piezoelectric material, as a single crystal, has no center of symmetry, and it's polarizable. And that usually comes about from the fact that uh, if we take this as, a, as the ideal unit cell, this ion that sits in the center, um, in a idealistic way in most materials. Turns out if uh, this goes from being cubic to, to being tetragonal, 
Um, there's a possibility for this ion to shift upwards or down. In fact, this ion doesn't sit exactly in the middle. So the unit cell itself sustains a polarization. It's also possible for these materials to be, and I'll show examples of the, these materials, where they're rhombohedral, which means they have a polarization along the body diagonal. And so that ion will shift this way or this way. Of course, that picking which orientation that extension is for it to actually be rhombohedral, there are four possibilities. The four possibilities for rhombohedral, the three possibilities for tetragonal, all come into play in terms of what we show and how the measurements occur. And it's all actually, I think, a very beautiful part of, uh, of crystallography. But uh, most of the materials that perform really, really well, the materials that have a very strong record, are based on this formula. So they're lead, zirconium, titanium oxides, uh, where it's an alloy of zirconium and titanium. So it's actually uh, PZT. The, the shorthand for it is called PZT. The lead-containing materials are the ones that perform the best, uh, at least in the neighborhood of room temperature. Uh, and that has historically been present. We know that uh, most of us do not like to eat or breathe lead. And uh, so the problems are producing the material means that if you work in a factory that produces this material, you have to have blood tests. If you need to dispose of these materials afterwards, there is an allowance still in the EU. There's an allowance to continue allowing these materials to be used for a number of applications because we haven't found anything that replaces them and produces the performance. In fact, some diesel engines perform very well using these materials. So you have the choice of having less emissions from the diesel engine, better performance, or, having, or not having lead. So that's really the, the choice. And that's often how in many things with uh, environmental concerns and sustainability, that's often uh, the situation. We don't have a really perfect choice. There are three properties. I'll just give the words pyroelectricity, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, effect of having a polarization that's based on temperature. Ferroelectricity is actually uh, analogous to ferromagnetism. It's the ability to actually kind of store the polarization inside the material. And piezoelectricity is the connection between the mechanical and the electrical for these materials. And applications include speakers, microphones, buzzers, um, the uh, ultrasonic drills that have been used on some of the uh, uh, exploration missions for NASA. Um, this is a very important application if you go into the hospital and they need to give you oxygen uh, during a procedure or because you have some issue of breathing. The uh, oxygen flow monitors are actually put right adjacent to where the tube goes into your nose because that way you know if the technician is standing on the tube and keeping you from breathing or parked a cart on top of the tube so that you don't actually receive the oxygen. So pretty important applications and they're everywhere um, in many different parts of our lives. There's a direct effect for piezoelectricity, which relates polarization to an applied stress. Usually we use D as the piezoelectric constant. It's a third rank tensor, usually the form you see it in, it's been collapsed into a second rank looking tensor, into a second rank matrix form, but it really is a third rank tensor. Uh, and the idea is, is if you apply a stress, this is the polarized piece of the material, this is electrical contact, you apply a, a, a stress to it, you can measure a change in the field across the material. That's how we use it as a sensor. And then the converse effect is if we take a, a piezoelectric material which has been activated by pulling, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, if we apply a field to it, it changes dimensions. And that's how it's used as an actuator or used as a speaker. Uh, the materials that we, that we work on have two characteristics. This is just a set of images. Uh, documenting, and there are not many examples where you can see these, but documenting the fact that what we have inside of an individual crystal in these materials are domains. So I showed earlier, for example, for tetragonal, uh, and I talked about essentially discussed in the terms of having the c-axis perhaps being up in that case because I showed the polarization. It turns out an individual unit cell has the choice of its c-axis being up, horizontal, or going in. Because of that possibility, these materials at a high temperature typically are cubic. As we cool them through the Curie temperature, the individual crystals, usually because of the uh, interactions with the grains around them, they don't just become tetragonal from one orientation. They pick the multiple orientations. And then so you end up with the possibility of this and this coming up against one another. These are two domains. And the boundary between those is a domain boundary. Right? And usually when we process the material, we end up with equal, for every crystal, we end up with about equal fractions of this 
this and this. Right? So we end up with about equal fractions of those possibilities. We have the long axis in any one of these three possibilities. And then within those, we have the possibility that it's plus or minus. So essentially six possibilities that are viewed here. These are just showing the ferroelastic component, so the mechanical component. And these are just, you, you can tell by the imaging that it's going to be alternating points. If you take one of those materials out of the furnace, you process it. If you buy one that's uh, just been just processed in that way, it's dead. It doesn't do anything. It's not an active uh, piezoelectric material. You have to pull it. To pull it, what we do is we usually apply a high electric field to it, usually at an elevated temperature in order to get the domain walls to move a little bit easier. And then we freeze it into that structure and freeze it into that structure so that it is now an active piezoelectric. So there is actually a bias. I'll show that in a second. Then it can often behave as a, as a ferroelectric material. So this is how the material starts, right? And this, we can actually pull at room temperature, but usually it's easier to pull at a higher temperature. So this is how the material starts when we receive it. Once we apply a field, field is this axis, polarization is this axis. Once we apply a field and then remove the field, we end up with some remnant polarization, some leftover polarization. So thereafter, you can never get back to the center. You end up with a part, one that's here or one that's here. Uh, most of these materials are polycrystal and are ceramic that I work on. So the examples I'm going to show are not single film, uh, uh, thin film materials or single crystal materials. They're polycrystalline or ceramic materials. Uh, several years ago, um, there's been a long effort to try and make uh, lead-free uh, piezoelectric materials, and a lot of different systems have been explored. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was at a conference. In fact, this was a, a little bit earlier in 2009, and a colleague, uh, Xiaobing Ren, uh, who works for the National Institute of Material Science in Tsukuba, Japan, uh, he was giving a presentation uh, in a conference on piezoelectric materials that was held, being held in Xi'an, China. And he showed this figure the first time it was shown in public. And there were a lot of people there from the EU, actually, who were working on other systems, who were working on other systems, usually based on alkali materials. And I'll show an example of alkali materials a little bit later. But there was a lot of discussion about the results. So he had introduced essentially what should seem by the formula, if you look at the, the formula on the top, um, it's a, a material which is, consists of barium, zirconium, titanium oxide. Barium, essentially a modification of barium titanate. And barium, calcium, titanium oxide, with the nickname of BZT, BCT. Essentially an alloy system in this. What's amazing about the discovery is, is that people had worked on BZT, BCT materials in the 1950s, but they picked compositions all the way around the ones that perform well. Essentially, they did all the compositions around the ones that perform well. All that uh, uh, Xiaobing Ren did and his colleague uh, Wen Feng Lu was say, all right, what would we want to do if we had these materials to produce a case wherein we could get good performance? So he, they tried to imagine phase diagrams that would look like the ones that we see, for example, for the PZT materials. So they just made the material. Apparently, they made the material and, made, and uh, really on one of the first experiments, uh, made some measurements on it. And uh, they were very surprised at the measurements. Uh, it was presented uh, uh, about a year later for the first time in public. Uh, it was this system, which is shown here. Um, so it's a, essentially a pseudo phase diagram. This is temperature. This is composition. Showed what is classic to, uh, to piezoelectric materials, which is we tend to have two uh, lower symmetry phases adjacent to one another. In this case, it's rhombohedral and tetragonal. And at a higher temperature, it's a, a non-piezoelectric material. It's actually cubic. So this material has, this is a, a, a piezoelectric, ferroelectric material. This is a piezoelectric, ferroelectric material. And the best performing materials, the PZTs, for example, um, have the similar arrangement, a rhombohedral and tetragonal next to one another with cubic above. And usually, at this boundary or near this boundary, which in PZT is very vertical, but usually near this boundary is where you see the best performance of these materials in terms of piezoelectric properties for a number of reasons. Okay? So this was uh, produced in 2009. We had uh, uh, Xiaobang come uh, to our laboratory and meet with our students. Um, 
up to then. A lot of people were very skeptical as to whether or not it would be a useful system, in part because of the temperatures, the application temperatures we have for a lot of PZT or for a lot of uh, PZ PZT materials are higher than this, and so there was concern as to whether this could be useful for a lot of existing applications. For me, our interest was the ability to go and explore a few phenomena and actually see if we could understand what was going on. My interest is trying to understand how domain motion affects these properties. And so for this system, uh, compared to many of the more engineeringly si significant materials, right? The, the beauty of this system is I can actually go with a composition here and I can cross this boundary by changing temperature, right? And so I, and I can do it because it's sloped enough. That actually makes it so it's not a great material for applications, but for exploration, it makes it a, a pretty useful material to try and understand. And we were working for the National Science Foundation. We we're supposed to be exploring science, so we didn't have to worry so much. At the same time, the properties were pretty impressive, and we wanted to understand why they were so impressive. So if we look at the tetragonal material, the type of measurement we have done, particularly on PZT for a long time, we wanted to apply to this type of material. So if I look at an individual crystal, as I showed earlier, um, these are the six variants. So these are the two possibilities with the axis this way, axis this way, axis this way, and it's plus minus or minus plus, right? So those are the six possibilities. We cool the material from a high temperature. That's what we get. It's essentially a dead material. We do x-ray diffraction. Most of the time we're doing x-ray diffraction with our samples horizontal. So if we do x-ray diffraction, if this is the, the type or the prototype for these types of orientations, what we would see in x-ray diffraction for the 002 peak, which is an allowed reflection, and the 200 peak is that this peak is about half of that one, right? And that's because there's twice as much of these two, ones with a short dimension here, as there is of this, right? And so that's what we see. What happens when we pull the material, right? what happens when we pull the material, and I'll just go, it says we apply a large electric field to it, right? And we want to get the domain boundaries to move. So we start the process here. I've actually started to, to move some of these boundaries from the prior image and go a little bit further as we start to then move this boundary and make this larger because the electric fields applied here will get more response from the material. If we do that, we actually start to shift. I think it's on the next one. Start to shift these peaks around. So we end up with this flipping of the amounts. And that's actually the measurement that we make most often is on how much of this domain boundary motion has been made. And not just in crystals that are this orientation, we also do it for crystals that are all the other orientations. So they, we then try and understand what's taking place in the material. Pretty simple calculations you can do to find this relationship. Essentially, if we were to take this all the way, right? if we were to take this all the way to the final edge here, uh, we can have essentially three times as much of what we had initially for this individual crystal. It turns out the maximum value for what we call the multiples of a random distribution which is MRD, the maximum amount we can have of that is three, okay? So we do a calculation that's based off of that, and we can look at that relationship. If we look at different crystal systems, this is from a, a paper in 2005 uh, that, we, that we did. We look at a rhombohedral material, tetragonal material, and an orthorhombic material. We can define the characteristics of the strain, a lot of the details, but the ferroelastic MRD, this term, that I described there. For tetragonal, as I said, is three. For rhombohedral, there are four possibilities. And for orthorhombic, there are two possibilities because you're usually just switching between A and B. Okay, so we can have the, the maximum value for this is four, three, or two. If we could include the polarization, the plus minus part, which is usually a different measurement, but if we include that, it's essentially twice that. So there's eight possibilities, six possibilities, and four possibilities based on the crystal structure. And from that, you can evaluate the possible strains and many other things that can take place in those materials. So this is from a couple years later, from 2007. Um, this is for tetragonal materials, for tetragonal PZT materials. It says the maximum value that we can measure, and this is the maximum value we can measure on this plane when we do x-ray diffraction on this plane, right? The maximum value we expect uh, is this value of three. What this plot does is it shows the relationship for crystals that would be this orientation, 
this orientation all the way to 90 degrees. Right? So we actually go through the whole process. This is theoretically what's possible if all of the grains moved, if those domains moved the favorable direction for all of them. And this is what we actually get in a commercial material. And so the question is, the potential of the material is up to here, right? But we, in this polycrystalline material, only get a much lower value. The reason we must get a much lower value is, goes back to the micrograph I showed earlier, it's a polycrystalline material, and the grains push on one another, right? And so you end up with actual stresses, things that the neighboring grains suppress the ability for this to, to occur through all of them. So we never actually reach this level. Although in some of the materials we're work on, working on recently, particularly the BZT materials, pretty stunning that they come really close. They come much higher than these uh, PZT materials in terms of the amount of ferroelastic domain motion, which may be one reason why they perform very well. Okay? But this is what we looked at. This is the uh, applied electric field. You know, we keep applying electric field. Uh, the reason we stop applying electric field at much higher values is because the samples blow up. Right? So the samples, there's a dielectric breakdown, and you hear a bang, and there's a set of electrodes, and then the sample is somewhere else in the room or has moved somewhere else, and it's got little melted components on it and stuff. And so students are very disappointed when they make samples and they blow up. So I'm disappointed, too, because there's no, going to be no data. So if we look at the material that uh, Xiaobing Ren uh, originally produced, and we compare it at room temperature, uh, under well-controlled uh, conditions, the material at, ironically, exactly at 50-50 at room temperature. So it's a pretty amazingly fortuitous that the best properties are exactly at 50%, 50% of this material and at room temperature. That's entirely a, 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 uh, a serendipity or an accident. Um, but this is the 50 BZT. This is strain applied to the material versus, apply, versus electric field. And these are some of the best performing lead-containing materials, right? So at least over a narrow temperature range, um, these materials per outperform in terms of strain the best materials that we had at the time in 2009. So, and that's his result uh, superimposed on there. We made our own materials. Details of the processing are shown here. Uh, this is our first, these are actually our first results this is polarization versus applied field. So you saw earlier I showed a, a ferroelectric polarization loop. These are very slender, so they're not very wide uh, and very tall. They, look, uh, they actually look pretty, pretty sultry, I guess, in some characteristics. This is strain versus applied field. This is the originally published result of, uh, of Xiaobing Ren, and this is our result and for the polling conditions we chose. And uh, so we were able to, under some uh, performance, we get this appearance. Often the strain loops for these materials, uh, for piezoelectric materials, the most classic viewpoint, the strain loops look a little bit like butterflies, right? In this case, for the conditions we used, for the composition, for everything else, they actually look a little bit more like seagulls. So uh, seagulls versus, uh, versus butterflies. But, uh, so we did uh, investigation, uh, actually Bin Jin Lee, uh, did a master's degree for us, uh, and he explored the tetragonal materials. And so we did compositions all the way across here, right? And I'm going to show you kind of those results all encapsulated uh, in one set of, of views. So essentially, this is going from the center, so this is 50 50 up to 90 10, right? And this is x ray diffraction showing the results. So we did those results, not able to view it here, but if you look here, you can see. The difference in the lattice parameters, that's due to the shift in terms of, uh, uh, of 2 theta. And you can see this characteristic uh, 1 versus 2 for the left versus the right side for tetragonal materials. So exactly the same thing that uh, showed earlier. So these are materials that are in the unpolled condition. Um, we got the lattice parameters. So we pulled the lattice parameters for these, um, looked at them uh, for that whole spectrum. So we also looked at the properties for those materials, tried to understand them. This is the set of polarization loops. You notice as you go from 50-50 to 90-10, we get a little more fat loop progressively. You notice as we go from there to here, we go from the seagulls more to butterflies in terms of, uh, in terms of the shape and the characteristic behavior.
And so there are a number of different things going on in terms of domain motion that determine that, which we really don't have time to talk about today. But we looked at these materials, and then we wanted to understand you know, whether there are other ways to optimize them and get better performance out of them. That's, in fact, what happened with our result where we got the very large strains. The, uh, if I go back, if I go back to here, we had chosen our own polling conditions in terms of temperature and in terms of applied field. And the question of whether we use the same as, as what were being used uh, in Sukuba was on our minds. We applied as much field to these materials as we possibly could. It turns out, in this case, uh, 3,000 volts per millimeter is a really large field. If your sample breaks down at that point, it's pretty scary. It's very surprising in these materials because they're not 100% dense. There are some pores, but they're able to sustain that large a field. Um, so uh, without blowing up, and, uh, which, is a, which is a good thing. So we also did a set of experiments exploring uh, temperature. And so this is a set of, uh, of explorations for uh, a particular composition. And we explored what happens with temperature. So you can see that it's very tetragonal at 30 C and it becomes less and less tetragonal as we go up in temperature. But this is a very strong change, right? This is a relatively small temperature change. It's a very strong change in terms of lattice parameters. So it actually changes, changes quite substantially. Um, these are small dimensions, but it changes substantially. And then it looks essentially above 90 C, it looks essentially cubic. 120 C looks essentially cubic. So then there's the question, if it's cubic, applying a field should do nothing more than just polarize it while the field is applied. Uh, but we had questions because of the, the, the route in which we had used to uh, pull the material. So if we actually go forward. So this is uh, what we did. The, the method that was used by Benji is the field cooling method. So we did polling of these materials at 30C, 60C, 90C, 120C. And you're able to see that at 120C, what we did is we applied an electric field while it was cubic and held it through temperature. So we cooled it while it was under applied field. And it makes a difference to do so, right? Even though at 90C, it looks like it's all cubic, there is a residual effect of pulling it at even higher temperatures. We've reproduced this recently uh, several times um, on different compositions pretty close to this, uh, but, e but on either side of it. So there is a pretty strong effect. This is a stronger effect than we see in some of the other materials, or at least most of the other materials. The real conclusions from this piece of the presentation on uh, BZT, BCT is phases can undergo orientation dependent phase changes. And within those phases, both fer ferroelastic and ferroelectric domains can be oriented. In addition to working on these materials at the same time, we've been working on the systems that have been studied a lot more, uh, particularly uh, materials being studied uh, with support uh, in Germany uh, by the Zonderforschungsbereich, which is present at uh, at the uh, TU Darmstadt in uh, Darmstadt, Germany. Chris Fancher uh, did research uh, with colleagues there, spent last summer there, actually summer of uh, 2012. And he wanted to look at the effects of crystallographic texture on the electromechanical behavior of these materials. Now these materials, BZT, BCT sounds complicated enough. Uh, these materials are KNN, where N is two different Ns, right, sodium and niobium. Um, B, N, T, B, T. So these materials, you can have them as just B, N, T or N, B, T, depending on which order you like, or you can have them as N, B, T, B, T, or you can go to the extreme as K, N, N, B, N, T, B, T. So it becomes very, it's hard to edit the papers, right, to keep track and make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, you know, I do think there's a lot of attraction. My PhD thesis was on tungsten, and I only had to worry about a W, right? And uh, that was a little bit simpler. But that's where we are with a lot of these materials, is it, it makes a difference to have uh, these compositions. So B and T, B, T, K, and N is a material that uh, has been shown to have a very high strain, uh, so-called giant strain behavior uh, by the Darmstadt group. It is, uh, uh, has, uh, transition that's temperature dependent between uh, a couple different states, which we won't have to describe, but more what we call relaxer behavior, a little bit different behavior than uh, what I've described for the BZT, BCT. Uh, 
Um, but there is a very large field strain associated with the electric field induced phase transitions. And for this particular composition, um, they were able to get very high performance of these materials. And so that's, those materials have existed for a while. What we did is we introduced these materials and we actually processed them so there was a preferred orientation. So even if they were cubic, we processed them, processed them at high temperatures so that there was a preferred orientation. So we were trying to make a material that had a preferred orientation to begin with to exploit what happens. So there we're actually looking at a crystallographic texture on top of a ferroelastic texture. Okay? So we use tape casting to produce these materials. Tape casting is essentially smearing the material out. If you put in platelets of uh, uh, crystals that are, have an extended shape to them, they tend to get oriented when you spread it out. And so, uh, so Chris put in five weight percent of these materials um, that were essentially a BNT material. And so essentially we put in what we could treat as a seed to seed orientation in these materials. So these are the materials that, uh, that Chris made. Um, this, we use the same term of MRD. MRD one means random. 1.4 means it's 40% more oriented than a random sample for the particular orientation you're looking at. Um, in this case, it would be 80%. In this case, it would be 900%. Okay, so what that says, for these materials, if we look at the, the C-axis for these materials, the one zero zero, if we look at that orientation, there is nine times the likelihood of finding that orientation as you would find in a random material. So these are pretty strongly oriented materials. So we looked at a range of these materials. Then you have to realize we're taking these materials and inside of the grains, these same phenomena are going on in terms of, of domain motion and domain characteristics. So we actually get to look at the crystal orientation and the domain orientation and the synergy between the two. So we did property measurements. Templated means textured or preferred orientation. Random means materials where we didn't introduce a preferred orientation. This uh, is the strain behavior. So this is strain versus applied field um, for unipolar loading. So this is actually just going one direction. And this is for bipolar loading, which means we apply a field and we sweep forward and back. Notice for these materials, they go, in this case, from butterflies. This is kind of like fat seagulls, but, uh, but they um, go from one to the other. Or you could say it looks like a tulip or something like that. But uh, hopefully, if it's spring, we'll get to see tulips. So. Um, in Chicago. Um, the behavior for the random material is shown as the dotted line, behavior for the oriented material. And these were not strongly oriented pieces, but you see a difference in the behavior. So you, you see more strain. And you see more strain in the bipolar test than in the unipolar test, which surprised us. Okay. So these materials were made. Uh, this is the coordinate system, the tape casting plane. And Chris wanted to study the effects of applying field, so apply electric field. So we made samples where we could apply the electric field in this direction. So it's the direction along which there's a lot of orientation. And then went through and made the strain measurements. Okay? So the, the strain measurements that are shown here, uh, this is the strain measurement in the direction of applied field. This is the strain measurement um, perpendicular to it. And this is the strain in terms of volume. So the volume is shown here. Okay? So we were able to show those materials and show that there's a difference. Um, in this case, we applied electric field across the actual tape casting plane. And you can see that the, this is the direction of the applied field. This is the uh, uh, perpendicular in one direction. This is perpendicular in the other direction. You end up actually having two different ones to evaluate. And that's the change in volume there. So this is the combination just showing these two. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to explore the anisotropy that's introduced in terms of strain behavior for oriented materials. Chris is going to defend his thesis two weeks from today. He may pass. We, we never commit to students passing at that point. But, uh, but in that, he describes, and I just was reading it last night, but he describes the reasons why and the characteristics and how it relates to, uh, to dom domain motion. Uh, what I wanted to show you today was I wanted to show you that, that there are uh, effects of texture and strain behavior. Um, the other things I did not cover as strongly here, but it is true that the field direction does not change um, the underlying field-induced phase transformation in these materials. Turns out these materials, as you apply field, undergo a phase change that allows you to get the higher strain behavior. And the strain response is not affected uh, very much by changing 
the field direction for these materials. And I'm very happy to answer any questions if you have some. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Questions? Any of you? Just one from my side. Mm -hmm. um, which one of these materials is, in your opinion, the most promising one? I think it depends a lot on the application. So the materials I presented in the end, uh, uh, because of containing things like potassium and sodium, they're a little bit more moisture sensitive. So for the applications, you're going to have to make sure somehow you exclude them from moisture effects. The really nice thing about the BZT, BCT materials is that they have really good performance and they're not, there's really no moisture effects. They're much easier to process. I didn't really go into them very much, but they're you know, processing, you know, barium oxide, titanium oxide, zirconium oxide, they're all things that uh, I don't know that they're good for us to eat, but they're all things that are, are not bad for us at the same time, that there are things that we process for other systems, zirconia, things we process all the time, um, pretty well and pretty consistently. The, the, the materials in the latter part are moisture sensitive. There's a little bit more uh, question as to whether they degrade or how the defect effects are there. Um, and they, there's definitely a fatigue effects on repeated cycling of the materials that are, uh, that are a concern. Uh, but there are people who are working on that, working on trying to resolve a number of those things uh, uh, for those materials. That is, in fact, you know, a little bit of the debate between uh, the folks working on those materials and, and uh, also from when uh, the first results were presented by Ren. When the first results were presented by Ren, you know, he kind of said, well, you shouldn't work on those materials because they're not th the other materials, the alkali materials. Here I have this really easy system to make. But the criticism there is the fact that that boundary is very, is, uh, very slanted, that the temperatures at which they perform well are not very high. So I don't know that for normal applications that we have, there you'd have to operate in some mode wherein there's cooling, right? And so, so that's a problem as well. He has made some other materials more recently that allow that temperature to be a little bit higher, but they don't perform as well. So it's all, you know, it's all in this challenge of, you know, we get it's some benefit. We can, yeah, we can, never, we can never really win completely uh, in terms of doing these things. The properties are, are impressive, uh, but they're impressive over relatively limited ranges. There are questions as to how, re, you know, how reproducible in terms of fatigue and cycling they are there. So, so I'm, my concern is that really neither system will result in at least widespread applications. I think they're much more likely to be small niches of applications, maybe more sensor applications, but not the actuator applications, which are really the thing that we'd like to replace lead-containing materials for. Um, and, and so it is, you know, that, that is a challenge. So I, I don't know that these, these materials are going to really solve the question. And then maybe that's good, because then we can keep doing research. So. Because at present, uh, uh, we are still using lead uh, materials for this. Uh, yeah, for the demanding applications as actuators, uh, uh, in most cases, it's lead containing. You know, there are other materials that find niche applications for very, you know, bismuth containing materials, things like that. And so it becomes much more of uh, individual places in which they insert themselves. But lead containing materials, uh, including uh, PMN, PMNPT, PZT, all these different ranges of, of materials, you know, you know the, essentially the chemistry gets tied to particular performance attributes wherein they're successful, and it's the, there's a lot of versatility. Uh, so so it, is a real, it is a real problem. Uh, you know, lead is, uh, you know, people worry, people who are not in material science sometimes, uh, particularly in other engineering fields, uh, think that we are overly qualitative and overly focused on magic dust or magic things that, uh, that we add to the materials. And, but in this case, you know, lead oxide is, is magic dust, right? I mean, it does, it does have a lot of abilities that we haven't been able to replace it. Um, our colleagues who don't have very strong chemistry backgrounds think we should just be able to come up with something, right? They can replace it that it's not as hazardous, but it's, it's not that simple, so. But that also gives us jobs, so, so that's a good thing. So. Okay. Any questions? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this